So it may not be just putting on weight, but also the distribution of that weight. And the distribution of that weight, putting it on round the centre, is related to position in the hierarchy, and that in turn may be related to chronic stress pathways. So we said, does that happen in monkeys? Because they organize themselves in a hierarchy too. And it turns out that it does. Uh, subordinate monkeys are more likely to have fat in their abdomen than are dominant monkeys. I think the most amazing observation that I've made in my lab is this idea that stress could actually change the way you deposit fat on your body. To me, that was a bizarre idea that you could actually alter the way fat is distributed. Sapolsky, Shively, and others think stress could be a critical factor in the global obesity epidemic. Even worse, fat brought on by stress is dangerous fat. You know that fat carried on the trunk or actually inside the abdomen is much worse for you than fat carried elsewhere on the body. It behaves differently. It's, it, is, um, it produces different kinds of hormones and chemicals and has different effects on your health. Whatever it is that works for an individual, they, they need to value stress reduction. I think the problem in our society is that we don't value stress reduction. We, in fact, value the opposite. We admire the person who not only multitasks and does two things at once, but does five things at once. We kind of admire that person. How do they manage that, you know? Well, that's, it's, that's incredibly stressful way to live. And we have to change our values and value people who understand a, a balanced and serene life. One heartbreaking moment in history reveals that stress may, in fact, damage us long before we are even aware. Holland, late 1944. A brutal winter and a merciless army of occupation conspire to starve a nation. It is known as the Dutch Hunger Winter. For those who survive today, these are haunting memories. Ik kon hem niet zelf voeden meer. Het leek wel of ik de tering had. Zo ziek was ik. En dan moet je voor zo'n kind gaan zorgen. Dat vond ik heel erg. Dat heb ik gedaan op de Dam, naast het paleis. En ik heb gevraagd aan de kostres, wilt u zo lang als de oorlog duurt mijn kindje grootbrengen? Want ik kan het niet. Dutch researcher Tessa Roosboom had heard many of those tragic memories. She and her team wanted to know if there were any lingering effects. Roseboom knew that our bodies respond to famine in much the same way they respond to other stressors. So she set out to see if the fetuses of women pregnant during these arduous days could possibly be affected by stress. Because of meticulous record keeping by the Dutch, Roseboom was able to identify over 2,400 people who could have been impacted. She and her team analyzed the data from those born during and after the famine and came to a surprising conclusion. I think that you could say that these babies were exposed to stress in fetal life and they're still suffering the consequences of that now, 60 years later. <laughs> Many of the Dutch hunger winter children live today, all in their 60s. Many still bear the scars of war. We found that babies who were conceived during the famine have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, they have more hypercholesterolemia, they are uh, more responsive to stress, and they generally are in uh, poorer health than people who were born before the famine or conceived after it. Researchers think that stress hormones in a mother's blood triggered a change in the nervous system of the fetus as it struggled with starvation. This was the fetus's first encounter with stress. Six decades later, 
the bodies of these Dutch hunger winter children still haven't forgotten. What we now know is it's not just your fat cell storage that winds up being vulnerable to events like this. It's your brain chemistry. It's your capacity to learn as an adult. It's your capacity to respond to stress adaptively rather than maladaptively. How readily you fall into depression. How vulnerable you are to psychiatric disorders. Yet another realm in which early experience and early stress can leave a very bad footprint. If I had had an option, I would not have opted to be bipolar. But now that I am bipolar, I'll have to live with it. Dus dan, dan heb je dat gevoel van als je wat soepeler leeft, dat je dat niet hebt. Ik kan het niet echt zeggen. Ik ben wel uh, gauw boos. What the Dutch hunger winter phenomenon is about is experience environment starts long before birth and adverse stressful environments can leave imprints, can leave scars lasting a whole lifetime. We're just taking fingerprints because no baboon has the same fingerprint as another one. So we just took um, Coney Bears and I'm hoping to go over to Riff and get his. During this year's multi-generational research, Robert, who has spent his career documenting stress's effects on the individual and on the cell, tracks the trail of stress even deeper into our bodies. One of the most interesting new directions of stress research is taking the effects of stress down to a nuts and bolts level of how cells work, how genes work, that half a dozen years ago nobody could have imagined. The once unimaginable genetic structures called telomeres, which protect the ends of our chromosomes from fraying. As we age, our telomeres shorten. What's interesting is stress, by way of stress hormones, can accelerate the shortening of telomeres. Uh, so the assumption is for the exact same aged guys, if you're a low-ranking guy who's just marinating in stress hormones, your telomeres are going to be shorter. So how does this formidable finding apply to us? San Rafael, California. Once a week, Janet Lawson keeps a very important appointment. She joins other mothers who share circumstances that produce chronic, unremitting stress. So, but she loses her balance, and that's the scary part. So we just went out, actually, last night and bought a new helmet, just for fun. And again, that as she's getting older and wanting more independence, it's getting harder. Each of these women is mother to a disabled child. And for us, my son's only eight, and, and there's enough I can handle, and I don't allow myself to go too much out. I can't. I had a friend recently who said to me, you know, I think you really should consider putting Lexi in a home. Mm -hmm. And um, that was really stressful in and of itself to think, wow. So, sorry. Yeah, don't be sorry, honey. <laughs> so I was like, wow, how could you even say that? She's, you know, a little girlfriend. She's, um, even though she can't really communicate, she loves she loves. She loves. She loves. These remarkable women came to the attention of biologist Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn. I don't directly know the individuals, but I know the stories. I'm a mother myself, and so when I heard about this cohort, I really thought it was worthwhile finding out what really is happening at the, at the heart of the cells in these mothers who are doing such a difficult thing for such a long time. Dr. Blackburn is a leader in the field of telomere research. We have 46 chromosomes and they're capped off at each end by telomeres. Nobody knew in humans whether telomeres and their fraying down over life would be affected by chronic stress. And so we decided we would look at this cohort of chronically stressed mothers and we decided to ask what's happening to their telomeres and to the maintenance of their telomeres. What we found was the length of the telomeres directly relates to the amount of stress somebody is under 
and the number of years that they've been under the stress.